good morning. Uh, we will have a faculty lecture today. As we decided, we are, we are uh, trying to cover the different topics in recent bonds in surgery, which covers the fourth paper in uh, DNB and MS examination. So we will try to cover all the topics in next few months. So today, uh, Dr. Sanjay Devakshi is a very renowned teacher in our uh, uh, circle. He was earlier in CMRI. Now he is consultant at uh, AMRI uh, Mukundapur. He is uh, our central uh, EC member of ASI. So Dr. Bokshi has a lot of interest and he has publications on uh, uh, GIST also. So we will listen uh, from Dr. Sanjay Devakshi, uh, GIST. Dr. Devakshi, please, we can start. Thank you, Professor Shah. Uh, am I audible and is my screen visible? Yes, yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. So my brief today is uh, to talk about gastrointestinal stromal tumors. And uh, for a start, it is a tumor which started life as a leomyoma or a leomyosarcoma in, in, back in 1949. Conley and Owen from the Veterans Administration Hospital in Illinois reported on 16 sarcomas of the stomach, five myosarcomas, nine lymphosarcomas, one fibrosarcoma, one myosarcoma. So you can well imagine that life has evolved and we've changed a lot and our knowledge has changed a lot since then. Sorry. Uh, what happened was basically the G term GIST was introduced by Mazur and Clark in 1983. Lab investigations aim at the subcellular and molecular levels demonstrate that GIST do not possess the ultrastructural and immunohistochemical features of a characteristic of a smooth muscle differentiation that are seen in leomyomas and leomyosarcomas. There was a seminal paper, <clears throat> and this was the seminal paper. <clears throat> Sorry, it came out in the American Journal of Surgical Pathology in 1983. And they studied 28 gastric wall tumors classified by light microscopy. And they did an uh, intensive study. And they found that they were not derived from smooth muscle. The presence of S100 protein suggested a nerve sheath origin in some cases. So basically, uh, they are the GIST, is the gastrointestinal stromal tumors, are the most common measles climate neoplasms of the GI tract. GIST can also originate in the mesentery and the umbilical. Overall, the GIST are a rare and rank a distant third in prevalence behind adenocarcinomas and lymphomas among histologic types of GI tract tumors. But in India, we don't have statistics, and I'm sure Professor Shah would be the first person to tell you that we do see a fair number of GISTs in of various areas of the uh, uh, abdomen. Um, you know, intestinal, non-intestinal, retroperitoneal as well. The realization came that GIS, the GIS do not arise from smooth muscle cells, but from another mesial chimal derivative, which were programmed to form spindle and epithelioid cells. And it was at about this time that Keen Blom and Associates reported in 1998 that the actual cells of GIS is a pluripotential mesial chimal stem cell programmed to differentiate into the pacemaker intestinal cells of Kahal. This finding led Kinborn and co-workers to suggest the name GI pacemaker cell tumors. Now this man, but yeah, he, described, he discovered the interstitial cells. This is Santiago Ramoni Kahal. And after spending about a hundred years in obscurity, people said, so what? It's an intestinal pacemaker cell. So what does it do? So, you know, after about a hundred years, people suddenly started talking of Kaha. It was this ASTs originate from their precursors. You see, what happens is the mature intestinal cells of Kaha are dependent on a protein called KIT. Cells in the surrounding milieu, see, I mean, tumor cells don't exist in isolation. They also take an input from their surroundings. And in the surroundings uh, milieu, there's something that produces a stem cell factor, which encourage or deter the growth of ICC. A kit mutation can turn the cells permanently on, forming GISs. So 
what is CD117? CK proto oncogene is located on the chromosome arm 4Q1112. It encodes KIT, which is a transmembrane tyrosine kinase. Stem cell factor, also called steel factor or mast cell growth factor, is a ligand for KIT and exists primarily in the dimeric form. It binds to the extracellular domain of CK. So therefore, this is an inactive cell membrane tyrosine kinase. When the stem cell, stem factor, I mean, hinges between both arms, it immediately activates the tyrosine kinase, which as you can see is a transmembrane protein. And in the activation, what happens is downstream phosphorylation and production of various hormones, which can actually influence the nucleus to start producing uh, more cells. And I'll take you through that. Growth factors such as stem cell factors stimulate receptors such as KIT. Kinase activity stimulated by cross-phosphorylization. And you can see that cross-phosphorylization is happening out here. It stimulates growth once it's transduced into the nucleus and mitogenic activity follows. So you can see under normal circumstance, what happens is the stem cell factor binds to the extracellular domain. It follows phosphorylization and you have a signaling cascade and various target proteins are made. And the target proteins include MAP kinase, RAS and others. Ultimately, what happens is these cells go into the nucleus and once in the nucleus, they start they, they are transduced into the nucleus and they start producing mitogenic activity. Imatinum mesylate was discovered. <clears throat> it was developed for the treatment of chronic myelo myelogenous leukemia. And the success prompted the use of imatinib therapy in GIST. So what was done basically, you need to realize that there are various locuses on the tyrosine kinase. And the most common is 11, which is a juxtamembrane domain. And that is the most commonly mutated axon in the GIST. In phase two trials, it was found that the GIST mutations occurred in 60 at, at the 11 uh, domain in 67% of cases. They generally respond to treatment with imatinib mesylate better than mutations in other domains. It doesn't mean that there aren't other domains. One of the commonest domain is an extra membranous domain at, say, at exon 9. And these are primarily found in 17% of cases and predominantly only known to occur during when the primary tumor originates in the small bowel and colon. They have a lower response rate to imatinib mesylate when commercial can compared, compared to people who have exon 11 mutations, but a better response when compared to the wild type exon. So we also have other mutations, other intracellular um, uh, domains, 13 stroke 14. Why is 13 stroke 14? If you go through the papers, a lot of them say 14, but then the later papers always also say it's not 14, it's 13. So 13 and 14 and exon seven, which are located out here are rare ridges. And because it's so rare, it's not much is not known about this. That's not the end. Recently, we've had occasion to find an extra cell membranous power domain as well. And that is called exon 8. Exon 8 is situated here. Right. So what are the variations? So variations, therefore, are KIT mutant just 80%. We do have plated derived growth factor uh, receptor A mutant gist in 5 to 8%. They have a predilection for the stomach, epithelioid morphology, myxoid stroma, nuclear pleomorphism, and KIT is variably expressed. We also have a wild type GIST in 12 to 15%. They don't express the kit antigen, but the kit is still phosphorylated. And we also have a kit negative GIST in 5%, uh, where mutations occur in the plated derived growth factor receptor alpha in 30%, and the KIT gene mutations occur in about 50%. So we do have GIST syndromes. And what are the GIST syndromes? You have the NF, a neurofibromatosis type 1, 
multicentric GS occur in the GI tract. Mutations occur both in the KIT and PDGFRA. And, I mean, they are not positive. They are, they do, but, but they are not positive. They are positive, well, not present, but they are positive for the ketamine. You have the Carney triad syndrome, where you have the gastric epithelial edges instead of the spindle cells. You have the extra adrenal paraganglion and pul pulmonary chondroma. The suicide gist are predominantly of epithelioid morphology and tend to occur in the antrum of the stomach. Lack, they lack the conventional KIT and the PDG of FRA gene mutations and tend to run a fairly indolent course. Thank, thankful for that. We also have a familial gist, the high penetrance heritable mutations in KIT and PDG FRA. One or more benign gist occur by middle age. You have multiple gists associated with like, uh, neurofibromatosis type 1 and germ, germ line kit mutations and secondary gist mutations acquired during imatinib therapy. Now, there's one issue. We normally say that gist never metastasize. This particular element, the NF1, if they do metastasize to the lymph nodes, then that is a very, very bad prognosis. And that's something that you need to keep in mind. So, GIST can occur anywhere in the GI tract. There are submucosal lesions, which most frequently grow in the, inside the lumen, endophytically, in parallel with the lumen of the affected structure. But they might also manifest as exophyte, extraluminal excrescences. So they grow outside. And these tumors have been reported ranging in size from as small as one centimeter to as big as 40 centimeters big. So this is an approximate estimate from a paper with an extensive trial of a multiple, uh, from multiple centers, and you find that 50 to 70 percent of just occur in the stomach, 20 to 30 percent in the jejunal ileum, less frequent sites of 5 to 15 percent occur in the colon and rectum, esophagus less than 5 percent, and primary mental and mesenteric gists have been reported, but they're very rare. In our particular series, and we've added three more gastric to this during the lockdown. We've had 14 gist, small intestinal 6, colorectal 3, esophagus 1, and one retroperitone. And this, you can see a gist of a very smooth, sort of homogeneous gist growing intralumally into the stomach from the lesser, lesser curve. Just like you also, we also have gist which look like lionitis plastic. You can see that the stomach wall is completely replaced by a uh, tumor. We have a, we had a patient coming in with features of intestinal obstruction and for our postgraduates, you can see that there's a concertina effect. So that is the jejunum and you have the characteristically characterless features of the ileum. You know that the valvuli condiventes gives this con concertina effect. And this patient presented with in intestinal obstruction on a CT scan, that was there and you are required to recognize that this is something called a target lesion. You can see lumen within a lumen. So that was, uh, uh, and obviously when you see an out target lesion like that, that's an interception. And sure enough, we had an interception at the time of the operation and we found this gist of the small intestine there. We also had sequel gist and we had gist arising from the rest of peritoneum as well. So it's a quite ubiquitous tumor. Now, imaging in GIS, it correlates with the chance of red runs and metastases. Tumors that are larger than five centimeters are prone to metastases or recurrence. If they are lobulated, if they enhance heterogeneity, mesenteric fat infiltration if present, if there's ulceration, if there's regional lymphadenopathy, as I said, or an exophytic growth pattern. These all, if they are, they're, these features on CT, they're more likely to recur and more likely to metastasize. So you have somebody who has a pure gist with a completely homogeneous margin out here. Equally, you have people coming in with a huge ulceration. This lady dropped a hemoglobin to three and we needed, needed to do an emergency exploration on her. Fortunately, we could do it laparoscopically, but um, that was purely because it was for fortunate because it was fairly high up on the fundus, as you can see out here. And that was a 12 centimeter lesion with an ulceration. So obviously this patient is a, is a candidate for 
post-op adjuvant therapy. You also have people coming in with, you know, patients coming in with heterogeneous models. You can see that while it's endophytic, growing in intraluminally, this is still extremely irregular. And if you compare this to the first JIS, this doesn't look right. So this has more chances of recurring eye metastasizing than the first candidate. And you can see that you have an extra phytic growth. That's the stomach. This is a lady who came an elderly lady who came in with a huge, huge gastrointestinal tumor growing outside, involving the muscles out here. And you can see which muscle in the next plate. In the next muscle, you will see that it actually involves the diaphragm in the precordial region. This in an 83-year-old who'd already had three stents. And in addition, you will also notice, and you shouldn't be missing that, that she had a political cyst as well. Um, as I said, I showed you this plate earlier. You have a gist with almost looks like a linitis plastica with the whole wall infiltrated. But if you, the next, sli next slices, you see that there's mesenteric infil fat infiltration. So obviously, this patient has a poorer prognosis than somebody who has a homogeneous lesion. So histology, you have a spindle cell in 70%. You have epithelial cells in 20%, which are often kit negative and react to the platelet-derived growth pattern set by alpha mutations and of sometimes frequently present in the stomach as well. And you sometimes have a mix uh, in both spindle and epithelial cells being present. Immunohistochemistry, kit mutations occur in 90%. PGDFRIFJ mutations in the rest. But originally, we, did, we found out that CD34 was often found to be positive. And there was a period in time during, uh, you know, earlier on when our knowledge wasn't so uh, uh, intensive, that CD34, we said, you know, suggested that the patient has a chance of records. It doesn't. But that was what we thought at one point in time. You have a dog one IHC, this brown predominantly in just one, the marker that is inevitably present, irrespective of KIT and PDGFRA mutation, and we've recently discovered that, is PKC theta. It's an IHC that is present, never mind whether the patient exp uh, expresses antigen to KIT and PDGFRA. Now, how do you stratify the KITs? In 2002, we had it easy, guys. I mean, you have it far more because of the knowledge is increased. And Fletcher had this simple uh, uh, stratification. Very low risk, smaller than two centimeters and less than five mitotic figures for 50 HPFs. Low risk was two to five centimeters, less than five to 50 HPF mitotic figures. Intermediate risk was smaller than five, but more than six to about six to 10 uh, mitotic figures by HPF or 5 to 10 and less than 5 to 50 HPFs. High risk was all the others larger than 5 centimeters, more than 5 to 50, larger than 10 centimeters, any mitotic rate, and any size and more than 10 uh, HPFs. Now, our knowledge increased, and this was a very difficult sort of a slide that came in from UICC that actually said, you can see that this is the stomach. The stomach has more or uh, contributes more to the green zone. I mean, it was safer. So it was probably safer to have a gist in the stomach than in any other, the jejunum or the duodenum or the rectum or all other sites. But that wasn't a very good, it was a very complicated thing. So the eighth AJCC classification is what you need to follow. The eighth AJCC classification said this, that TX is a primary tumor that cannot be assessed, T0 is no evidence, T1 is a tumor less than 2 centimeters, T2 is 2 to 5, T3, 3, 5 to 10, T4, more than 10 centimeters in its largest dimension. If you had lymph nodes and no lymph nodes, it's N0. Any lymph node was N1. There's a reason for that. Um, M0 is no distant metastases. M1 is distant metastases. And mitotic rate has been defined by the 8th AJCC as low if you had five or fewer mitotic counts per five millimeters square, or a high over five mitotic counts per five millimeters square. Now, now that is the basic. Now, this is where it starts to get interesting and it's actually better. Stomach, if you're considering the stomach, T1 or T2 with an N0, M0 and a low mitotic uh, rate 
was 1A. T3, similarly, with 1B. T4 uh, was also, um, uh, with a low mitotic rate, was 2. But the moment you had high mitotic rate, you had stage migration. A T1 became 2. A T2 became also 2. T3 became 3A. T4 became 3B. If there were any nodes, and this is the point I'm completely repeating time and time again, if you have lived, lived on metastases, it qualifies as a stage four. It doesn't qualify at any other stage. And if you had an M1, obviously um, that was a stage four as well. So that is a better, that is for the stomach. We had also a staging for small intestine, esophagus, colorectal, mesenteric, peritoneal, which means for all the others. Here, a T1, T2 with N0, N0 and a low mitotic was one. T3, N0, N0 was two. T4 was 3A. But the moment you had a high mitotic rate, there was a far more progression, far higher escalation of the staging. You can see that. If you had a T1 with a high mitotic rate, it was straightforward. 2A. So then you jumped one and went to three, three A. T2 with a high was three B. Similarly, T3 and T4, they were all three Bs. And of course, N1 again was four and M1, N1 was four and M1 was four. So that is the recommended staging that you guys need to follow for your examinations. Stratification of risk, the tumors related factors in risk stratification are the anatomic side there for histologic type, the size of the tumor, depth of invasion, grade, well to poorly differentiated, the M staging and the mitotic index were the important prognostic stratification factors. Now, the next generation stratification is probably on its way. And by the time you pass out, and, uh, you know, within the next couple of years, you might be talking of uh, molecular biology. So addition factors in risk are related to the tumor, presence of a kit mutation, mutational site, whether it's in the kit or the PGDFRA, are stasis and rupture during surgery, whether it's primary or record, and related to the host, neurofibromatosis type 1 or age of presentation. So if I give you an algorithm, you had a localized gist, if it was symptomatic, yes, you go in for a resection that could be laparoscopic or open. If the mass size was more than two centimeters and um, you know you went in straightforward for a resection, you didn't take a risk. Now, if it was less than two centimeters, the suggestion is you resect if the US suggests an endoscopic ultrasound suggests. And if the endoscopic ultrasound suggested that uh, you didn't need to go in and dissect. I mean, I'll, I'll give you that factor. So you could keep this patient under surveillance. And what are the US findings of, this is classified as a small sub-epithelial lesions, SEOs. The accuracy is 45 to 5 to 48%. So out here, what is suggested is, is an EUS <coughs> or a biopsy. And biopsy means that if you have <coughs> Uh, gist in the subepithelial phase, it's more than likely that if you take a small punch biopsy, you're going to get normal mucosa. So you had to go into the depth. You had to go into the tumor to take the biopsy. And the other option, therefore, was a US, US FME. So what are the features? If, a, if it was a lipoma, fat is very bright on an, on an ultrasound, so highly echoic. Cis, you had anechoic masses. Jace, you had hypoechoic solid masses, and the risk features of high risk were if it was more than two centimeters, if it had irregular borders, if it had a heterogeneous eco pattern, if it had anechoic spaces. Remember mm -hmm. that in CT scan, we said there's a difference. If you have a heterogeneous mass, that's more likely to be risky. So, anechoic spaces on an endoscopic ultrasound in a small lesion. If you had ecogenic foci, and of course, if you had a rapid follow-up and this patient had an increase in size, that was something that you needed to be careful about. So we nowadays do a lap uh, resection and I'll show you the uh, video of time permitting. We use methylene blue for marking. 
we used to use methylene blue. You can see that if you use methylene blue, there's a bit of a stretch into the mesentery as well. There's a bit of a leak. It's methylene blue. It spreads inside the tissues. Another problem that happens at the another problem is you have to having green sometimes passes green urine. You need to warn the patient about that. So, if you had an R, you just followed up. If this patient had a high risk and um, you put the patient adjuvant um, imatinib, and the dictum is 36 months, um, you know, which means three years. Now, I must warn you about something. If the patient has features of high risk, and I have recently had this occasion, I had moved a gist in a in a elderly lady, and Dr. Advani of Tata Memorial Hospital had put on um, adjuvant imatinib for four years, and then he said, "Okay, four years long enough." And you know what happens if you give imatinib? Imatinib affects the vascular endothelium. She landed up with a deafness thrombosis at the end of. Um, uh, uh, about four years. And so he decided to stop. The moment he stopped, she came back after three months to four months with the records. So, you know, it's not absolute. So you need to be careful of, you know, blunderbuss statements like that, you know, that uh, 36 months. So you have to be careful. So the ESMO guidelines, R1 surge, R0 surgery, not possible. So you put the patient on imatinib for six to 12 months. R0, R1 surgery feasible, you go in for surgery. R0, R1 surgery, not feasible. Then you move forward to the next uh, treatment. So what are the next available treatment? Now, this is where you are going to be as modern surgeons, you're going to be coming in. So you actually define the area, the type of mutation, and you find out whether what sort of sensitive mutation. And I, as I said, if you had a mutation in exon 11, it was more responsive. It was more likely that it was uh, going to be responsive to imatinib in 400 milligrams a day. That's the usual dose. If you had surgery, you went in for a response. Now, if you had an exon 9 and you know that this sort of, uh, at this uh, domain, the tumor is not very sensitive to imatinib. So the initial suggestion now is you start off with 800 milligrams of imatinib if the patient can tolerate that. We've had a number of patients coming in back with various vascular problems. And what we are worried about is if you have an elderly patient who comes in with a DVT. So that is something that you need to be very careful about if you're using imatinib. So if you don't have a response there, you have a chance of going into sunatinib, which is the uh, next generation uh, TKI, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So basically, if you have given new, new adjuvant therapy, let's suppose we've given sunatinib and that's the line we are following, you find out whether there's a progressive disease or a partial response or a stable disease. If you have a partial response at a stable disease, you continue. If there's no partial response or stable disease, the next generation of TKIs that you might choose to use is regorafenib. If you have a partial response and a stable disease, you continue. If you don't have a partial, a, a partial response or a stable disease, you, if you have a slow progressive disease, you continue with that. If you have a fast progressive disease, you go in with a TKI re-challenge and I'll come to the concept, why do we go back to imatinib if that's, if you've gone through sunitinib and you've gone to regorafenib and it is, isn't responding, you have a tendency of going back to using imatinib again. There's a rationale for that. And that's going to be my penultimate slide. Right, now this is important query. How do you reassess a patient of GIST who has been on neoadjuvant therapy. You reassess at one to three months and there are two criteria that you can use. Either you can use the RESIST 1.1 or the CHOI criteria. And what are they? 
I find that the Choi is a very difficult sort of thing to estimate. I find the resist 1.1, which is something that you can use across the spectrum, easy for us to remember as deep practicing clinicians. Because if you have a retroperitoneal sarcoma, you still use the same criteria. So you, what are the resist 1.1? You could have a complete response, which means disappearance of all target and non-target lesions without any new lesions. So if I can concentrate on that, you've seen the choy that is used, but it's best that you don't consider it. So CR, as I said, is disappearance of all target and non-target lesions without any new lesions. A partial response is a 30% decrease in the sum of maximum diameters of all individual measurable lesions without any new lesions or progression of any non-target lesions. Stable disease does not meet the criteria for any of the other responses. And Progressive disease means a 20% increase in the sum of the maximum diameter. So you take a, a Y and an X axis, the sum of all diameters of all individual measurable lesions, and there's a 20% uh, increase in the progression of any of these signs. So this is a resist 1.9 criteria. Guys, you need to remember this, and this is very important. Right, as I said, one of my penultimate size is how do you assess, and this is Dr. Tamas Odog from the Mayo Clinic. And this was an excellent study. And what he said was this, if you see, you start off life with a tumor which has a lot of kid sensitive uh, cells. So it's imatinib sensitive gist. You've used that. And the moment you've used that, you have a persistent gist because now these are kit independent precursors carrying imatinib sensitive kit mutations, but expressing very little kit or no kit protein. So what happens is you have a secondary mutation. You have cells populating, kit cells differentiated from kit low response. So now you use sunatinib and regorafinib and these cells die. And then sometimes it gets repopulated again by imatinib sensitive gist. So you could, uh, that is the rationale. When you use sumatinib, if you remember this slide that I showed you, we've used sumatinib, we've gone through the process, there's no partial response, there's no stable disease, we've used regorafinib, there's no partial response, no stable disease, You and there's a fast progressive disease, there's a scope for um, a re-challenge with imatinib. So this slide actually uh, tells you just that, that you could go the whole circle and try with imatinib once again. So that is the principle of treatment of resistant GISDs. Right. So thank you if there are any questions. And for a final process, how can I show that video if uh, people permit? We have to still have a bit of time. Uh, I'm afraid you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah, we can we can continue. Yes. You have time. Okay. Okay. Thank. Right. So this, this is something that I'm going to show you. It's a a very short uh, thing. We've started off from here, as I said about the. Um, methyl in blue being used. And we have a particular technique for gists on the, on the greater curve. What we tend to do is put in stitches and to after, after mobilizing, you've taken the momentum off. And having taken the momentum off, we put in stitches. And we find this a very useful adjunct. We put in a uh, suture pasta and we hitch up the stomach to the surface. So now remember, that our margin has to be two centimeters. There is a bit of a doubt whether it should be one to two centimeters. We prefer using a two centimeter margin. So now that you have this elevated, see what the beauty of hitching it up is that you need to see the stomach on both sides. And the way to do that is you can now release or relax the tie and see the anterior surface. We are trying to get the stapler across. And having done that, now you twist on the other side. 
just to ensure that you are not catching anything up. So there we are. And we ensure that there's at least a two centimeter margin from the tumor. We started using India ink nowadays um, instead of the methylene blue. Uh, we find that that doesn't blotch up, that doesn't spread as much. So now that we've taken it out, that's the beauty of using that hitching stage. So now we have to take that bit. Now the problem of using endostaplers is that as the tissue gets compressed, uh, a bit uh, gets pushed out because if you are compressing something, it sort of broadens. So we desperately are trying to uh, finish the operation with two staplers, less of expense for the patient, but you see what happens. Because of that spread, you see, we technically we think we've gone beyond. And inevitably what happens is two things. A, you see there's a bit of bleeding from here where uh, the two staplers uh, overlap. And because of that spread, the increase in breadth, you still have a bit of uh, tissue left to cut. So, uh, you know, that was a good attempt at trying to keep it to two staplers, but, um, you know, I'm afraid sometimes you can't do that. You will have to, we did do an overrun uh, of that bleeding point as well. So I promised uh, Professor Sa that I'd give you time for questions. So uh, Professor Sa, if there are any other questions. Yeah, actually, uh, it's a very good, uh, uh outline of GIST starting from uh, molecular biology to management. So, uh, Dr. Mukti, if I say that most of the time the question is obtained, mark. suppose they have a question on... Sorry, Professor, I'm uh, just putting a microphone on. Uh, yeah, most of yeah. the time the question is for 10 marks. Suppose they give, there is a question on uh, management of GIST of stomach, then what should be the basic outline of answering that 10 marks question? Uh, how do you manage a GIST of the stomach? Yeah, so you say I'm asking 10 marks question answer. What should be the uh, coverage if one should uh, uh, write in the exam? Well, I think what we, uh, first uh, should be assessment. Uh, like we always say, you confirm your diagnosis. Uh, you know, the patient can present with bleeding, in which case you need a confer uh, to diagnose the patient. Diagnosis would be by doing an endoscopy and, and uh, uh, a CT scan to assess the tumor. Now, if the CT scan tells me that this is an exophytic growth with involvement, there's the treatment is new adjuvant uh, therapy with amartinib. If there is a complete intraluminal growth and it is beautifully heterogeneous, upfront surgery should be the first option. Now, in upfront surgery, if it is a greater curved tumor, it is far easier to approach it laparoscopically. If it's a lesser curve tumor, then you may need to choose an open uh, estimate. And if it's a lesser curve tumor, we have to remember that we've taken the nerves, the vagal nerve uh, have been divided. In which case, if you can save the nerves of lateral jet, then you might not need to do a pyloroplasty or a pyloromyotomy. If you have to take the nerves of lateral jet, then I'm afraid that you have to combine that procedure with uh, a pyloroplasty or a pyloromyotomy. So this is for intraluminal tumors. If you have an extraluminal growth, if there's true, the growth is extraluminal and all the features of possibility of recurrence, it is mandatory to get a biopsy. Now, if, if you remember that we showed you a plate of a lady, a 83-year-old lady with covering with a massive extra... Uh, uh, stomach lesion which was involving the diaphragm and the balls. The easiest way to get a biopsy there is a percutaneous true cut biopsy because that endoscopic biopsy inevitably fails and you know uh, I think Professor Shah has also mentioned that in his book that these tumors normally if you take a biopsy what you will find is atrophic mucosa, gastric mucosa unless you are careful you're fortunate enough to take a really deep biopsy. Now, if you've got a biopsy, 
you obviously have to do a complete assessment, not just the type of tumor, whether it's spindle shape, whether it's epithelioid, combined spindle or epithelioid, and above all, the mitotic form, which is something you cannot get in an FNA. So a biopsy is mandatory for lesions which you are planning a new adjuvant uh, treatment. Now, if you have something like that, uh, at the present knowledge, I because uh, access to uh, assessment of which uh, domain it is, uh, the problem is at 9 or 11, we, I mean, that is just still on its way. That is something that I would refer to at the end of the uh, my answer. But I would treat this patient with imatinib, 400 milligrams per day, assess in about six weeks to see whether the uh, by the rest is criteria, whether the lesion is settling down. <clears throat> if I can, at that point in time, do an AR0 surgery, I would definitely do an R0 surgery, confirm my diagnosis, and then extend my treatment. For the new recent advances, the, the tumor is assessed for its mutation site. If it's 9, exon 9, we treat this patient with 400 milligrams a day, if not, this is recent advance, incidentally, because we uh, it's not universally accessible. If there is an exon 11 problem, then you might need to treat this patient with 800 milligrams of uh, of um, uh, 800 milligrams of imatinib. And if the patient doesn't respond, then you have to go in for sunitinib. The problem of using imatinib at 800 milligrams is that you have hosts of vascular problems from the uh, tissue. And the one that we are worried about and we've had to stop truncate treatment in a number of people is leg devenous thrombosis. Dr. Yeah. Devokshi, if it's a theory question, then what should be the headings? Those are 10 marks theory question. I think they should come out within part of uh, pathology. Uh, yes. And, uh, yes, for the 10 mark extensive essay type question, yeah. what, how would you manage that? You need to also assess, you're quite right, uh, the pathology, you need to comment whether this is a spindle cell or an epithelial cell. Yeah. You also need to consider, and uh, uh, in a histology, you need to mention about the mitotic rate. IHC. And IHC, yes. And then presentation, investigations, and the management. You're given the good flow chart. If you just yes. read the flow chart, I think there's no need for description. Yes. If you follow these two, three flow charts, that gives the uh, answer. Yes, that's a terrific answer from a very experienced teacher. Absolutely right. So, any other question from the audience? You can ask question. Sir, I have one question. Yeah. Yes, no. Uh, sir, I want to know that do we routinely do exon 9 or 11 mutation in all the patients presenting with GIST or do we just do a biopsy and assume that it is exon 11 and post-surgery we put them on imatinib? No, as I said, Neha, that uh, this is a, uh, uh, an observation that is coming in. That's a recent advance. You know, Professor Shah asked me uh, whether we should uh, uh, for recent advances. So I gave you the entire recent advances. The Exxon assessment is not available for us here in India. So at that, your answer, you answered your question. You treat this patient directly with imatinib. Now, also, we've had another question. How do you decide to give new adjuvant, and where do you uh, use adjuvant therapy? Simple answer to that is that if you think you can resect, a GIST responds best to resection with a two centimeter mask. That is the prime treatment. You use new adjuvant treatment only and only if you think that you cannot do an R0 resection. Professor Shah, am I right? Yes, sir. A large few marks. Uh, uh, non resectable infiltration adjacent structure, then there is a role. Most of the time, this happens that we open up and find that you cannot resect the tumor. So, patient goes for new adjuvant and then come back for a uh, relook. So, if it is clinically inoperable, yes, you can give the patient a new adjuvant. Otherwise, upfront surgery is uh, preferable. And, Absolutely. sir, uh, uh, and, sir, uh, sorry, I have one more Please. part of that Please. question. Please. Sir, like Please, you were telling, uh, so, that, like you were telling that imatinib uh, has a treatment for overall 36 months and you gave an example where the patient was treated for four years and later on she developed DVT. 
so sir how do we tell the overall uh, treatment duration for a patient and do we need to counsel that uh, after a certain duration of adjuvant therapy the tumor might recur or something like that sir what should we do about it well this is an area where the knowledge is still uh, in its infancy you know the traditional suggestion is 3 years 36 months but you also need to tell the patient that if should your patient should your tumor recur you will need to go back on to amatadep so at the present moment the usual dictum is the accepted norm is 3 years of treatment having said that this by one patient of mine we were very early on in the knowledge of the disease and the dr advani of tata memorial hospital put her on 4 years of amatadep very very unfortunately the moment she stopped it Three months later, she was back with the record. So, you see, uh, yeah, it's very difficult to predict in tumors, but we are still we are still sort of uh, finding a way. But the accepted norm is three years. Uh, Professor Shah, how, what do you think? Yes, yes. The, the, we should go by the standard uh, regime now. It's three yes. years, and then if the patient is of high risk, there is uh, large tumors, and there is high risk of. Uh, 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 recurrence then one can consider extending but the standard description is optimal duration is 3 years 3 years thank you teachers okay thank you dr okay. dilbukshi for the nice uh, discussion in the morning fantastic thank you thank you thank, thank you, you. Thank you.